Hello, I'm Jeff Lasala, author of the upcoming book, The Silmarillion Primer. What you're about to see and hear is just my reading of the introduction so far, just to give you a sense of what the project is about. There are links in the description below if you'd like to find out more or even get involved in the next few months before it wraps up. Thank you. The Silmarillion Primer A Working Introduction This book began its life as a series of online articles on Tor.com, now called Reactor. I'd pitched them a Silmarillion-based blog series, and while they were keen on some Tolkien-related content, they'd felt they'd run too many rereads already and wanted something different, so I needed to find a new approach. But I find it's hard to discuss individual stories and concepts from the Silmarillion unless one has a clearer understanding of the book overall. One doesn't simply jump into the middle of the Elder Days of Middle-earth. That would be irresponsible. Too many readers have broken against the Silmarillion's archaism, like the first orcs against the Deeping Wall. One must be eased into it. So then I thought, how about a pre-read, a primer? Something that lays groundwork, that prepares a prospective Tolkien fan for an actual read-through of the Silmarillion. Bridget McGovern, the managing editor of Tor.com, was receptive and encouraging from the very start of this mad new scheme. And soon I was writing bi-weekly installments. They began in September of 2017 and ran through November of the following year. Each article was written in such a way as to precede one's reading of the corresponding chapter in the Silmarillion itself. I remain thankful to both Tor.com for its stewardship and the original series readers for their support. But now, like Narsil into Anduril, or Anglachel into Gurthang, the primer has been reforged to new purpose for a new format, this book. It's been reshaped, revised, and expanded specifically for Signum Press, which still has that new press smell. In this book, I will walk through, discuss, praise, and adoringly poke fun at J.R.R. Tolkien's seminal work. The chapters are intended to make your first, or at least your next, reading of the Silmarillion an easier experience. Whether you're a casual Tolkien fan, curious about what lies beyond The Lord of the Rings, or you're already a long-invested, deep-diving reader, I hope you will find something new in this book. It aims to unpack the Silmarillion's multitudinous concepts and make them more digestible. But this isn't a replacement. I want you to read Tolkien's own in far superior words for yourself as well. Maybe before mine, maybe after. That's up to you. What even is the Silmarillion? In 1937, The Hobbit was all anyone had of Tolkien's world, and it wasn't even identified as Middle-earth yet. There were only hints of a wider and older world. In Chapter 1, for example, Gandalf reminds Thorin about the Mines of Moria where the dwarf's grandfather was killed, but where the story of the Hobbit never actually goes. Gandalf even mentions the Necromancer, an enemy far beyond the powers of all the dwarves put together. And yet that mysterious foe plays no greater role than Gandalf's reason for leaving their company a few chapters later. Then, in chapter 3, Elrond, the vaguely elven master of the house of Rivendell, takes a look at the swords Thorin and company had swiped from a troll horde. He says... They are old swords, very old swords of the High Elves of the West, my kin. They were made in Gondolin for the Goblin Wars. This, Thorin, the runes name Orchrist, the Goblin Cleaver in the ancient tongue of Gondolin. It was a famous blade. This, Gandalf, was Glamdring, foe hammer that the King of Gondolin once wore. Readers might well have wondered, what is this Gondolin place? An alleged elven city, it seems, and one that's not identified in The Hobbit anyway. It doesn't factor into Bilbo's adventures at all. Moria, Gondolin, the Necromancer, such names were mere window dressing for readers in 1937. But today we would call them world-building elements, or Easter eggs, or better still, textual ruins, a term coined by Dr. Michael Drought in his talk, How to Read J.R.R. Tolkien. Fast forward to 1954. In the Fellowship of the Ring, Elrond, now a proper loremaster and half-elf, name-drops Gondolin again, this time at the council in Rivendell, where he, 
his counselors, and the strangers from distant lands. Discuss the fate of the ring, even in Book 2, Chapter 2, were only to understand that Gondolin was a city of high elves, and now it's long gone. Yet it would still be another 23 years before Tolkien's readers had Gondolin and other mysteries of the Elder Days fully explained. Mysteries like, who is this Orome fellow that Theoden so strongly resembles during the ride of the Rohirrim? Who are these Valar that a ranger of Athelion invokes when an Oliphant comes stomping onto the scene? Who exactly is the one that Arwen mentions at her husband's deathbed? These questions about history and the larger world are answered in the Silmarillion. And yet to this day, the book remains eclipsed by the more familiar stories about Bilbo's magic ring. Though, those more famous stories are really just more successful spin-offs of the world Tolkien had been constructing long before. Even Middle-earth itself is merely the organically grown byproduct of his invented languages. Tolkien was a philologist first, and a mythmaker second. After the success of The Hobbit, Tolkien did at last pitch his behind-the-scenes mythic saga to his publisher, Alan and Unwin, but they rejected it on the grounds of its being too dark and Celtic. After all, they really only wanted more Hobbit stories. Tolkien rolled with, and even agreed with, their rejection at first, but only because, as he explained, it needed rewriting and more thought. Sadly, he would be rewriting it for the remainder of his life. He lived to see it neither completed nor published. But because of his never-ending revisions, the Silmarillion we have today is, I'm just going to say it, a hot mess of a masterpiece. It was never polished to Tolkien's satisfaction. Do not mistake me, though. It's awesome to the core. It's beautiful. But the characters, names, stories, timescales, holy heck, even the math, kept changing in their making. Did Galadriel leave Valinor with her brothers? Or did she sail over the great sea ahead of them all? Did men awaken only a few hundred years before meeting the High Elves? Or had they actually been around for millennia? Did elves grow beards or didn't they? These and many other questions are explored, but never definitively answered in his notes and essays. Often, the particulars of Tolkien's stories gainsay one another. Yet he never gave up, never surrendered his work on this legendarium. Legendarium, a word he coined to refer to the entire mythology. And this lifelong dedication shows. It's revealed in the legendarium's power and depth despite its vast, labyrinthine, and at times contradictory tales. It fell to Christopher, Tolkien's third son, to pick up the pieces and organize them for us, with the assistance of now-author but then-academic student Guy Gabriel Kay. It was a labor of love for Christopher to do so. He'd always been the most involved in his father's world, but it was still quite an ordeal that would later include the twelve-volume history of Middle-earth series. In his foreword to The Silmarillion, Christopher explains, I set myself therefore to work out a single text, selecting and arranging in such a way as seemed to me to produce the most coherent and internally self-consistent narrative. And what a narrative it is. Anyone who's tackled the Silmarillion at least once can tell you it can be intimidating. Some, and I stress some, who have tried and failed to get through it have called it boring, dry, a slog. The language is often archaic, the chronology non-intuitive, the time spans vague and enormous, and the character and place names hilariously legion. But those who've made it through, especially those who've gone back to read it again and again out of sheer love for the world, know what a treasure trove it really becomes. I say becomes because you can miss a lot on the first or second or tenth go-around. Rereading reveals the Silmarillion as anything but boring, that rich language which starts as a stumbling block to some becomes poetry. Half the story is the art of language itself. The Silmarillion is Middle-earth's origin story. It's not a fantasy novel in the way we're used to experiencing one in the 21st century. There is no protagonist or united group of companions we're meant to follow. No hero's journey or revelation. No single plot or tight wrap-up or neat epilogue with loose threads for a sequel. But there is conflict. There is a clear antagonist. Indeed, he is the villain who spawns all villains. The Silmarillion doesn't resemble The Lord of the Rings in style or format. It's more like fantastical nonfiction, 
like a diegetic history book shelved in the library of Rivendell itself. The narrative often zooms out, way out, offering a god's eye view of all existence and spanning huge swaths of time in just a few sentences. Then, without warning, it will slow down, zoom in close, and observe the very words and manners of its characters. In those moments, interspersed between the time-spanning historical bits, the book comes tantalizingly close to resembling a novel, featuring snippets of dialogue, banter, and action. But they don't last. There are no hobbits, at least not until the very last section, where the halfling Frodo, alone with his servant, finds a way to wrap up the Third Age. The enormity of the War of the Ring seems almost a small thing when you've read all about the struggles of the First Age that preceded it. My answer to the intrinsic challenge presented by Tolkien's largely hobbitless masterpiece is this very primer. I'll help you weave through the lofty language and pluck out the strands of characters and names worth remembering. This isn't a reread, it's not follow up analysis, not a recap. It's a prelude aimed at Tolkien fans who want to know more. And for those of you who are familiar with Tolkien's creation myths already, those who have seen the light of the trees, I hope this will be a fun and possibly illuminating refresher for you. What else is it? The Silmarillion is fantasy of the highest order. It's a great drama unfolding beneath the wheeling fires of the universe and set in the deeps of time and in the midst of the innumerable stars. It's a world-like yet unlike our own. No accident, given Tolkien's early goals of establishing a fictional mythology for what he called the primary world, our world. The Silmarillion has many facets, and it contains an almost incalculable number of lessons, themes, and beautiful, astonishing, terrible characters, sometimes all at once. If I had to boil this book down to its bones, I'd say it's the story of a world wrought by an omniscient and flawless creator with the help of many flawed sub-creators who are wise but not all-knowing. Despite the book's sumptuous yet daunting language and larger-than-life heroes, it's imbued with all too familiar patterns of human behavior, even in its non-humans. It's also morally complex. I've often seen this perception floating around, particularly among armchair critics who have not actually read him, that Tolkien's world is black and white that his good guys are goody-two-shoes, that his villains are simplistically evil. My immediate reaction is always, not only have they not paid attention to the Lord of the Rings, they've for sure not read the Silmarillion. They don't know about Feanor or Turin. Yes, this book has its share of virtuous Aragorns and Faramirs, and it definitely has its I'll dominate everyone lol Sauron types, including actual Sauron. But most of its characters wade through murky waters of honor, pride, loyalty, and greed. Heroes fall into evil. Good guys turn against one another. High-born kings turn out to be total jerks. And powerful spirits tempted by evil either repent of it or double down. It's all there. Oh, and lest I forget, the Silmarillion features fantasy literature's most epic of jewel heists. Hell, when all is said and done, the whole thing is essentially a series of gem thefts. The titular gemstones... The Silmarils are both like and unlike the One Ring we know and love. They're coveted by pretty much everyone, even those who've never seen them. And they inspire some wicked deeds, yet their light is of divine origin. Not intrinsically corrupting, like Sauron's ring, the Silmarils do not possess the malice of their maker. In fact, they are hallowed, scorching anything of evil will that touches them. In Tolkien's world, their unique literary devices They're both MacGuffins and Chekhov's guns. When off-screen, they motivate characters to run around and attack each other, make oaths, or speak words that cannot be taken back. Sometimes, even a character mentioning the Silmarils can invoke doom. But when they actually show up right there on the page, and folks are actually there looking at them, well, then you know something's going to get burned, or stabbed, or slashed, or have something bitten off. It happens. And so that's the Silmarillion for you. It's all shining gems, flashing swords, whips of flame, foul dragon reek, and blood-soaked earth. It has more tragedies than victories, more sorrow than joy. Yet because it was written by a man of self-conscious faith, it also packs a few eucatastrophic punches. So chin up, good readers. The body count is high, 
but the payoff is glorious. Leaf Note The word eucatastrophe does not appear in the Silmarillion, but the concept sure does, if not as overtly as in The Lord of the Rings. Coined by Tolkien in his essay On Fairy Stories, a eucatastrophe is a good catastrophe, the sudden joyous turn, that brings victory or rescue to an otherwise calamitous situation. It is when providence appears to intervene in some form. It could be the Valar, or it could be Eru Iluvatar himself. By its nature, eucatastrophe is unlooked for. It cannot be counted on to occur. It is never guaranteed. Yet for a eucatastrophe to occur, the good guys have to put the work in first. They have to defy evil. They have to show up. The eagles do not join the Battle of the Moranen until the Army of the West has already engaged the forces of Mordor. Gollum doesn't forcibly claim the ring from Frodo until Frodo gets himself to the Cracks of Doom. To spoil or not to spoil. Tolkien didn't give a wargs behind about spoilers. They just weren't a thing in his time. We've become sensitive to the concept in our age of streaming media, but today's usage of the word spoiler wasn't even coined until 1971, according to the OED. Neither Tolkien nor his son Christopher had any such sensitivity. It helps to understand this when reading anything in the Legendarium, and especially in this book. Even in his foreword to the second edition of The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien casually refers to Sauron's ultimate annihilation. Like, whoa, spoil much? In the prologue itself, the narrator forecasts the fates of Pippin and Merry, revealing that they will both survive the trials ahead and go on to become heads of the Took and Brandybuck families. And of course, Frodo lives, man. So if you wanted to keep from knowing certain plot developments in this book, you're kind of out of luck. Tolkien is going to spoil them for you, and the sooner you accept that, the better it will be. Heck, spoilers often appear in the chapter titles themselves. In fact, once you start to pick up on this pattern, it becomes humorous. Anyway, if you didn't already know that the One Ring gets destroyed in the final book of The Lord of the Rings, then you may not be familiar with Luke Skywalker's parentage, know who Kaiser Soze is, or understand why Snape was such a jerk to Harry Potter. By the way, the walrus was Paul. Therefore, spoiler alerts are presented throughout this book to point out when Tolkien's narrator is forecasting the future and what we're learning from it. Say, who is the narrator? One thing a reader is bound to wonder at some point, whose account is this exactly? Is the narrator both objective and omniscient? Sometimes the narrative feels distinctly elven, as if they're composing the story from their own oral traditions. Other times it seems like the narrator is way too informed to be an elf, no matter how wise they are. Now, it's implied in the prologue of The Lord of the Rings, then later supported by Tolkien's notes, that the Red Book of Westmarch, Bilbo's account of his own adventures in the saga of the One Ring, also includes elvish legends of old, which means some or all of the events detailed in the Silmarillion could be found within Bilbo's book. But that's rather tangly. Alternatively, consider this excerpt from Morgoth's Ring, Volume 10 of The History of Middle-earth wherein Christopher shares his father's behind-the-scenes conclusions. What we have in the Silmarillion, etc., are traditions handed on by men in Numenor, and later in Middle-earth, Arnor and Gondor, but already far back from the first association of the Dúnedain and elf friends with the Eldar in Beleriand, blended and confused with their own mannish myths and cosmic ideas. This means the Silmarillion text may be what remains of elvish stories after they've been passed down to mortals, mixed with mortal ideas about the ancient past and applied serial edits by hobbit hands. In one possible and specific version of this process, the stories are first told to Alfwine, a mortal man, by an elf named Pengalov. But Tolkien never fully committed to this frame story either, so Christopher left it out of the 1977 publication. Regardless, it seems to be generally written with an elvish point of view. If it even matters. Ultimately, the narrator is in the know. At times, they are clearly omniscient, getting inside a character's head in a way that no elf could ever. 
without some secret intel from on high. For example, in chapter 13, we briefly learn the thoughts of an elf lord just before he dies. He doesn't tell his children, who are there with him in his final hour, about a very heavy truth he just then discovered with the foreknowledge of death. How then does the narrator know what this elf's mind discovered? They cannot, unless they know everything. All of this is mere myth anyway. But to Tolkien, myth was meaningful, illuminating, relevant. Much more can be said about his stance on fantasy and myth, and has been, in many books, by many people. For now, consider that today, maybe more than ever before, Tolkien's fairy stories can provide the perfect escape. Not from real life, because God knows the Silmarillion has its share of anguish and mourning alongside its triumphs and joys. I mean, rather, escape from whatever keeps us from keeping our heads, political cobwebs, social blinders, or whatever snake oil the profiteers of the modern world are peddling. Escape from whatever current discord troubles us. A note about maps. Christopher Tolkien's map of Beleriand and the lands of the north, as included in the Silmarillion, is excellent, but it doesn't pair exactly with the text. For example, the land of Osiriand shows a lot of blank space, yet it's described as green and forested in the book, and even Treebeard refers to the Elm Woods of Osiriand in The Lord of the Rings. I've recreated the Beleriand map in this book, but it's based on Christopher's alone. I do not presume to know where a forest should start and end that he did not himself draw. Consider all maps as mere guides. It's always the text that counts. Likewise, my maps include arrows to indicate directions and routes. These are not precise either. They are suppositions based on Tolkien's text to help readers visualize where on the map actions are taking place. A note about names. There are so many names presented in the Silmarillion. Characters, titles, places, weapons, and other objects. So, so many. No one needs to remember or even know them all. I've found that with each reread of the book, such details do become more interesting. But a first-time reader has enough to keep track of. Therefore, for each chapter, I provided a dramatis personae of note that merely identifies the major players within along with a short description of what sort of creature they are and what sort of role they play. A note about pronunciations. Half the fun of Tolkien is learning to pronounce his invented words. The Silmarillion has its own guide for this, but I wanted to help too, and was fortunate to have Quenya slash Sindarin slash Tengwar slash Kirth enthusiast Chad Bornholt around to help me. Plenty of names are simple enough to pronounce, like Tuor or Luthien, but some are not. I'm looking at you, Maidras, and you, Thangrodrim. I've provided a close enough approximation for most names the first time they appear. So for example, Maidras, the eldest son of the famous maker of the Silmarils, is pronounced something like Maidras, with the accent on the first syllable and a voiced TH, as in Bother thereupon, or loathe. Whereas Thangarodrim, the Towers of Slag, raised by Morgoth above his underground fortress, is pronounced than ga ro drim with the accent on ra, Thangarodrim. Elves would naturally roll every R, like those in Galadriel or Mordor. But a good rule of thumb for us mortals might be roll the R only when the next sound is a vowel like in Sauron. It's challenging at first, but it becomes enjoyable trying out loud. Still, it should also be said that one needn't be pedantic about pronunciations. If you're not actively speaking an elvish language, it's fine to use whatever pronunciation you find comfortable. No one should be gatekeeping the whims of language. Most people say Gandalf, for example, not Gandalf, which would be the accurate one. And that's fine. A note about notes. Throughout this book, you will find a number of leaf-shaped sticky notes. In fact, you'll have already seen or heard one about eucatastrophe earlier in this introduction. Consider them sidebars that offer brief explanations or make references to legendary information that exists in Tolkien's writing outside of the published Silmarillion, or The Lord of the Rings, or The Hobbit. None of them are imperative, but I think you will find them useful and or fun. 
In this audio form, each one will be prefaced with Leaf Note. A note about rings. Finally, there are a number of explicit references in the Silmarillion to people, places, or events directly related to the Lord of the Rings. I've placed a ring in the margin wherever such a mention occurs, as a way of one, making connections with Tolkien's most famous work, and two, helping first-time readers get their bearings. If you see a partially invisible ring, then it's a Lord of the Rings connection I'm making in order to draw attention to some parallel or related concept. But the reference isn't necessarily explicit in Tolkien's text. Mm-hmm.